If you're uh, joining us for the uh, Wildfowl Carving Magazine live stream, Bird Habitat Live, you're in the right place. Um, we will start in a few minutes. Um, so sit tight. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll give people a little more time to sign oh, on. Oh, sure. We'll that'd, start. Yeah, that'd be in, fine. In a minute or so, we'll officially start. Yeah, that'd be fine. I recognize some names already. Mm hmm. Well, I think we can go ahead and get rolling. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Allison, editor of Wildfowl Carving Magazine, uh, and I want to welcome you to the latest in a series of live stream events that we produce um, to support both our book club and the magazine. Um, today, we're going to be discussing the subject of our latest book club offering, Bird Habitat, how to create 12 stunning settings for your carvings. Um, and I'll just remind you, if you're a member of the book club, you will get this book soon if you don't have it already. I mean, if you aren't a member, I, I certainly encourage you to join. We're going to have a special offer um, for participants in this live stream. Um, and, and membership gets you a member's discount off the list, list price and a whole, a whole list of other benefits. So if you're interested in joining, I encourage you to do so. And if you use the URL at the bottom of your screen, uh, wildfowlcarving.com new book, um, there'll be a special offer. So be sure to check that out. Um, and as well, if you're not a subscriber to Wildfowl Carving Magazine, I certainly encourage you to become one. And because you're participating in this live stream, um, we'll have a special deal for you too. So that URL is wildfowlcarving.com webinar deal, um, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen there. So with that taken care of, um, joining us today is Tom Baldwin, who's one of the uh, featured contributors to the book Bird Habitat. Um, many of you may know Tom, but a brief introduction. He's an award-winning uh, carving artist. He won second best in world of interpretive at the 2017 Ward World Championship. Um, he teaches a beginner's bird carving class at Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. And he's also a regular contributor, contributor to Wildfowl Carving Magazine. 
Um, and you can see uh, Tom's wonderful carvings on his website, songofwood.com. Um, Tom contributed three chapters to the Bird Habitat book, including uh, a brand new chapter on uh, creating an orange daylily. So we'd like to talk to Tom a bit about this chapter um, and his contributions. And then we're gonna really roll into some questions that you've submitted. Um, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so Tom, thank you for joining us. It's great to, great to talk with you today. Uh, thanks for having me and yeah. <clears throat> good morning to everybody. Uh, let's, I, I, uh, let's get let's get acquainted. Yeah, I uh, thought we'd start talking about the orange daylily. I see your you, your matching shirt now with the orange daylily, so you're color coordinated. Yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I'm in the daylily mood. <laughs> what inspired you um, to include the orange daylily uh, in the book. And I'll, I'll note that the, the photos are, that you're looking at on screen are from the book and you can see just how beautiful this uh, habitat is for Tom's hummingbird. Um, well, first and foremost, I was going to do a hummingbird piece. And the last thing I wanted to do is another red flower. Everybody does them. And I didn't <laughs> want them feeding from a red flower. Everybody does that too. Uh, plus, my wife has really been after me to do something brighter than the usual fall and winter thing habitats I tend to lean towards. I just like them. I don't know. Uh, so I want to do something bright and pretty. And I was at my mom's house helping her out with something. And in the sideway to her entry of a back door, there's a whole pile of these daylilies and there were hummingbirds everywhere. So needless to say, the inspiration was pretty instant. It's like, oh, OK, that's what I'll do. And uh, here we are. So the piece is actually titled Mom's Garden. Mm -hmm. And in the book, obviously, you describe step by step how you put this piece together. So we'll we'll let uh, that those details be for the the members of the book club and the readers. But uh, if you could talk us through very briefly how these daylilies were put together, um, and I think yeah. was, the, the next slide would show that. Um, so yeah, okay. these are made of copper. Yeah, this is the this is thirty six. Um, um, not great. What do they call that? Uh, let me look at my cheat sheet here. I always forget this. Um, uh, oh, gauge, gauge, 36 gauge. Pardon me, I'm over 60. I have a lot of memory issues sometimes. It really <laughs> knocks me crazy, but uh, bear with me. Uh, anyhow, this is a 36 gauge copper, which is my favorite weight to work with. It's not too thin, not too thick, uh, very pliable. You can see that the sheets are cut out because each flower has uh, six petals and they're kind of in a tandem where three on the bottom and three on the top uh, slightly alder from each other. So the picture on the right shows how I designed the two pieces to basically fold together to, to make the one flower. And of course, you know, with the nice 36 gauge copper, you can get, I have a tool that's just a pen with a big silver ball on it. And I use that to emboss uh, you know, any of the copper to shape it and turn it and curl the edges and so forth so that I get something a little more interesting than a flat piece of metal, which mm -hmm. uh, is never very particularly interesting. So uh, some folks like to use brass, but I find brass is not quite as pliable for something like this. It tends mm -hmm. to look a little flat. And unless you're looking for a real flat uh, kind of habitat, I would recommend the copper. And uh, the next slide, I think, shows some of the other parts of the the uh, yes the daylily. So, um, so the the stems of the flower are brass tubing, obviously mm -hmm. soldered. Um, the book explains I have I think six or seven different sizes that I use, and I have the sizes well documented. They all mm -hmm. kind of telescope into each other mm -hmm. as plants go from thick to thin towards the end. Uh, so you have to get the uh, brass rods that you need uh, to accomplish that. The, uh, the buds on the left picture here are carved from Tupelo. They're just wood mm -hmm. and, and, and smoothed out and sanded. And of course, on the right is, is the uh, copper flowers that have been primed. Uh, first with, uh, I like to prime it with uh, what's, what's uh, called Mod Podge. And then mm -hmm. a little bit of gesso. And there's a question earlier about gesso. I use gesso always, even on carvings, even if I use the uh, the, uh, the the clear uh, TK on the wood first to seal it. The gesso is a sealer, but more importantly, the gesso is your white base to allow your color 
to examinally be exactly what it should be. Uh -huh. uh, you paint without a white background, your color tends not to be quite as accurate and you end up putting more paint on the bird than you really want. I think, you know, everybody mm -hmm. has their own way. That's, that's what I think, but uh, I use gesso always. And is the, the gesso you use, that is the standard like artist gesso? Because gesso- Oh yeah, yeah, Liquitex, uh, mm -hmm. you know, same stuff you slap on your canvas or right. your cold mm -hmm. press board or whatever you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I water it down a little bit. I might throw that in there. Don't use it 100. percent It's pretty. Yeah, good. yeah, it can be awful <laughs> thick. So, but it, it is the same stuff you can buy uh, at a craft store anywhere. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. not yeah just for carving. And then you said that the flower painted the base color is yellow. Um, yes. And really, I mean, the, the paint job, of course, is incredible on these. To think that um, that becomes such a realistic looking flower it, is pretty amazing. Um, and it's a series of washes of acrylic paint you use? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the base coat's yellow because, you know, to make the orange, we're going to use different reds and, and orange colors and so forth. And there is some yellow in the flower. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, yellow is a terrible color to cover with. It's, <laughs> it's, it's practically transparent. Uh, so the yellow was the natural choice for the base because you can add the reds to make oranges and reds to the yellow, but you can't add yellow to the red without putting a lot of paint on it or paint that white first or something like that. So the yellow was the base and no airbrushes were used in this. I, I was examining the petals, which I was able to take some really good pictures of my mom's flowers before I started the project mm -hmm. and, and saw too many opportunities for what I felt would look, would look better with, with hand painting versus airbrushing. Uh, I know People go to that tool a lot for blending, but you know what? A little bit of water mm -hmm. um, on the surface allows you to blend acrylics pretty well. It's really not that complicated. It's just something you have to acquire uh, a feeling for. But uh, uh, yeah, it was all painted with uh, different types of uh, round brushes. Uh, there's a quick question here that just popped up particular to this project. It's uh -huh. a question about, do you, did you rough up the metal? before applying the gesso. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, a good sanding, just give, give everything something to adhere to mm -hmm. is always a good idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I always sand them down. I usually use like a, just a, a like a 320 grit sandpaper and just kind of rough it up. Uh, it gives the, it gives the Mod Podge something to sit on. And, and of course, Mod Podge is a great adhesion promoter. So uh, mm -hmm. once you put that on, everything sticks to that. And mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a uh, it's a material I rarely don't use uh, on on habitat. And one thing we uh, noted previously is that um, not I mean the orange daylily you have the instructions for, but really a carver could tweak this uh, to create other lilies. The paint job, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, or you know the shape of the uh, uh, of the petals um, to create different lilies or different flowers. So. Um, Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it, any of this can be adapted to a different type of flower, different type of bud, different type of stem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, once you decide what your habitat is and you research it out, you know, you can either like take your phone and go take pictures of it in someone's garden somewhere, or even mm -hmm. in your own, or get online, look at photographs, become aware of how, how this plant is put together. Uh, well, once you decide that, then you figure out what, what uh, types of materials are going to use to create that. And yeah, the copper you cut with a pair of scissors. So it's able to be adjusted to whatever shape or size, small flowers, big flowers, uh, shorter petals. Some people even use paper for uh, flowers like, like roses or something where there's lots of layers of petals, but mm -hmm. uh, and maybe the last layer is copper to kind of protect everything inside. But you know, that's the, that's the fun thing about habitat folks. It's, uh, there are no rules. <laughs> Uh, you did two other projects for the book too, a teasel and a old man's beard. The old man's beard actually was pictured earlier, but this is the teasel. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, many layers you mentioned. So um, this, I know you said was a very fiddly piece uh, to put together. Um, why did you include a teasel? And then, if, you know, very briefly, how was this created? Because what you're seeing there is actually Tom's creation of a teasel, not a real teasel. Um, why did you include a teasel in the book? Well, um, it was an article that I had done mm -hmm. uh, a few years earlier. And at the time, uh, Tom Huntington, your, 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 the 
past editor uh, decided he wanted to have that in there because it's an unusual habitat. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. Um, I, I went back to the issue where it was initially started and, and someone actually wrote a letter saying, that, why would I pick this? Because it's a, an invasive plant and so forth. Well, <laughs> uh, not everything do I do is, is necessarily nature sensitive, but uh, in this particular case, I used the teasel because it was a, a situation I saw it in Canada the first time it's at the at the Canadian National Show. We happened to walk along the Grand uh, River up there, and there were a gazillion of these evasive teasels, but also lots and lots of song sparrows. And that whole thing inspired this whole piece that you see. Uh, so the teasel was never uh, like, well, what do I put here with the sparrow? It was really mm -hmm. kind of the other way around. I saw the teasels, and I wanted to do the uh, sparrow, and uh, here we go. Uh, of course, you know, as you can see from the pictures down there in the number five, it's a wooden spool, more or less. And number six, I show where I drilled holes, eighth inch, uh, uh, eighth inch holes in each little box that you see drawn in there. And in each hole, I cut out paper brands, that 70 pound text paper, and glued two of those in each hole. And I can only work on this thing for like an hour a night because the, the fumes from the CA glue kind of make you kind of goofy and burn your eyes so <laughs> it took a while to make two teasels but uh very pleased with the results now, and the funny thing is people say how real it looks but if you put a real teasel to it uh it clearly is a difference uh so it's interesting because this is where art can kind of uh indicate what things are but not necessarily replicate what things are so there's an energy to how we do habitat uh and it's an important lesson that you try to come as close as you can to it, but not necessarily do you have to match it, you know, branch for branch, twig for twig, point for point, uh, leaf for leaf. You want to make some of the more general things obvious, but uh, certainly capturing the energy of that habitat is really how it works the best, I think, you know, in terms of, uh, I never want these carvings to look so perfect that you can't tell it's art. Somewhere along the line, it still has to look like art. So I'm always, careful to make sure the habitat's close to mm -hmm. a real thing, but not necessarily exact. And uh, so it gives the energy of a real plant, but not necessarily does it represent it completely. Uh, yeah. You want time to be as close as you can. Yeah, as you mentioned in the book, the, the, the purpose of the habitat is to support the carving, the bird carving. Um, yes. And so your, your initial goal, while you want to obviously make it realistic, isn't necessarily to perfectly recreate no diesel orange daylily or whatever you're using you want to support the carving um as best you can yeah uh there's an energy and you want to try and capture that you want to capture that lifelike energy but not necessarily uh, an absolute duplication of it mm -hmm. um, and I, I just find those more pleasing and when i when i look at carvings at competitions uh you know like all of us do i always find those habitats that are almost perfect to be really interesting but you, you mm -hmm. can you look closely you can tell i remember uh, looking at a habitat that someone else had done and it had a lot of these small little buds it was a goldenrod and the small little buds were actually little punched out stars that were crinkled up mm -hmm. and is that accurate no but it sure made it look like it the mm -hmm. energy of that particular thing was gorgeous and it worked very well mm -hmm. uh, so you know uh, to, like I say, the nice thing about habitat is there are no rules. You know, we're allowed uh, rule-wise to use whatever materials we see fit. And then this teasel is a good example. The uh, the little antennas off the side, those are bread twisties. And, uh, and I chose those because when you're doing shows and you're traveling these things around, you don't want anything so rigid that either it would bend and stay bent or <laughs> so stiff that it would break. So, and wouldn't you know it, the first show I went to, someone picked up and snagged their, sh their sweater on the thing and it went from curve to straight out and this guy thought he broke it and I, oh, no, I just went twist it right back and you know he was like very relieved uh so was i uh but you know that and the branch are paper and the center of the thing is wood and uh so you know there's there are no rules to what materials you can use you you work through and find the ones that work best for what you're trying to make yeah and that that uh, I rolls into some of the questions and we're soon going to get into the, the questions that were submitted and one of those questions was in competitions what are the rules concerning the use of metal um yeah as opposed uh, to wood 
Yeah, as far as I know, and I've been doing this for a few years, the rules mm -hmm. are pretty simple. The bird must be carved of wood. We're allowed to use glass eyes and the habitat has to be made by the artist and by materials of our choice. So you could, you could probably use a half a pound of metal on something that's creating some kind of particular habitat and put a little bird on top of it. And I can't imagine why that wouldn't be accepted. Might be a little heavy, but uh, <laughs> uh, I have not seen anybody thrown out of a show because they use too much uh, brass tubing or too much uh, bronze. Some, some guys like to weld, I, I do that too. Uh, and you know, some of my habitat trees, uh, when I want to get real craggy looking things, I end up welding those with bronze mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I use quite a bit of it, uh, but I've never been thrown out because I had too much metal. Uh, yeah, the, so don't worry about that. Just <laughs> the rules know. apply to the bird, the body. Yeah. The bird, the bird is the word and uh, everything else kind of supports the narrative. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you want to make sure your birds as perfect as it can be. And you want to make sure your habitat is aiding to the narrative or presentation or the story you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. You know, worry about positive, negative space and, uh, you know, just try and make a nice piece of art. Um, yeah, and and uh, I do want to remind uh, the viewers that uh, Tom's uh, contributed to the book, uh, three wonderful projects. Um, we have uh, three other contributors who contributed projects. So the book itself covers flowers, teasel, rocks, branches, um, pretty much anything you can think of, and it's 12 separate projects. And of course, you can tweak those. Uh, there's probably an infinite variety of, of things you could do with this. Um, pine cones are covered, so it really does cover a variety. And uh, Tom and, and three other wonderful carvers um, contributed. So uh, with that, um, we were pleased to have um, a number of questions submitted by uh, people who are participating. Um, before the event. So I want to get into those and cover as many as we can. And we'll also try to cover questions that are coming through on the chat. So um, don't have an, an endless amount of time, but a good amount of time now that we want to devote to answering some viewer questions. And one question that actually was um, asked a number of times in a number of different ways is what kinds of materials do you use? What kinds of wood um, and you've kind of touched on that, but that, that was a question that a number of, of people asked. So what are your preferred materials and what are your preferred tools for your car okay. Um That's a broad question. Wood, <laughs> yeah, my wood preference is too below. <clears throat> uh, basswood's nice, but it's, I'm a power carver, so the Tupelo tends to work better in that regard. Uh, both woods etch beautifully, so you get any kind of texture, shape, or uh, surface that you're looking for. Uh, plant wise or bird wise or otherwise uh, and then of course brass tubing is a favorite for everybody because it bends nice and we can do lots of very graceful types of shapes and things with that uh, so I always have a good inventory of lots of brass tubes and different telescoping sizes into each other uh, brass rod too of course you know for the real small like stamens on flowers or bird legs and stuff like that uh, but I also weld as well so I use bronze uh, uh, bronze rods for some of my more complex uh, branch or types of habitat. So uh, not everybody has that equipment. Uh, it's a whole different kind of discipline, but uh, you know, the book that we have in front of you is uh, going to cover just about any kind of habitat you'd ever want to make. Uh, the, uh, the information that Al Jordan provides on like on his, his plants, his uh, grapevines and so forth, uh, you know, that's all solder and he does a great job with that. So there's nothing you really can't do once you get your hands in this book and, you know, whatever you see, if you don't want to do grapevines, do something else, but you can apply what he tells you and it'll work great. Um, so if you uh, uh, like to work with brass rod, I also have that little set of springs, you know, they're about so long that you put the tube in and it allows you to bend it cleanly because if you try and bend brass rod with a pair of pliers, it just cranks and you don't get that smooth curve that you'd like to have. Uh, and these are usually available like at a Hobby Lobby or something like that. Mm -hmm. So How about, uh, tools, I mean, I know you use both the power tools and yeah. other tools. Um, what are some of your go-to tools, preferred tools that you use? 
Uh, like I said, the springs for uh, for bending mm -hmm. the rod. Uh, I have X-Acto knives, of course. I never work without a 110 X-Acto knife. They're just indispensable for too many reasons and too many ways. Uh, I have um, uh, a variety of different tools I've actually made out of brass tubing that I use for texturing when you use, uh, for instance, if you need the aid of some of these, uh, um, you know, like the, the blue and yellow making the green putty or, or uh, any of the other uh, putties that you use to sculpt things you might want to use and make buds or little connectivities between the leaves and the branches or things like that. Uh, Sculpe, um, uh, I can't think of the name of it now. It's, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> I get these things. I don't think about it much. I just reach for it and use them. <laughs> <laughs> the two-part putties, yeah. It's a two-part putty. It's yeah. gray. It's mm -hmm. gray and uh, you mix it together and you can use that to, as we say, flesh the bark when you have your tube bent. You can mm -hmm. use it to create the bark and use different types of hand tools then at this point to texture the clay. So you're going to have a collection of a variety of different types of hand tools you like to use. These are the same tools you use to, uh, you know, create the scales on bird feet. Uh, and, you know, the same tools help you create any of the textures or uh, the the valleys and cranks and bends and so forth that you see on bark. And of course, uh, I never work without pieces of that stuff laying all over the table. I mean, mm -hmm. literally go out and take a walk, walk the dog, pick up sticks on along the way and take them home and throw them on the table. And, and I have something to look at uh, so that I'm replicating it pretty well. I don't like to rely on my memory totally because it's just not as good as it used to be. <laughs> <laughs> and, and tools, I mean, you can use, um, I mean, there's no rules you can use anything that works really or make your own tools um, oh yeah. yeah like yeah i know experienced carvers probably have a whole collection of things they use as tools that weren't necessarily bought uh in a carving shop no and especially in the in the area of, of, of texturing the, the 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 putties i mean mm -hmm. uh years ago i was at bob googie's shop and he showed me a little box he had full of what i thought was a bunch of junk <laughs> and it really, it was all his tools that he made for different texturing processes. And after he showed me how he's using them, it's like, oh, well, duh, wow, this is great. I mean, the guy was a genius. And, uh, you know, so and here I am, I have a box of that kind of thing now after all these years. I have my box of go-to uh, tubes that I've either searced a certain way or, or cut off at a certain angle or added different uh, cuts and textures in it so I get different uh, responses when I apply it to the putty. Uh, you know, experiment. That's part mm -hmm. of the fun. <laughs> uh, here's another uh, kind of more general question is why is habitat so important? Um, is it, and do you think it's often overlooked um, with carvings or not? Uh, habitat is a key essential part of the carving. Uh, it is, uh, lack of a better term, you're, you're providing a small narrative of this animal's life. So, and with hummingbirds are hovering around, you know, a day lily, get their, they're getting their meal. Uh, so we're telling that story. Uh, and if you don't have enough habitat to tell the story, you don't really get to tell much of it. Uh, part of the reason I do these types of standing decorative carvings, as we call them, is because I start with ducks like most everybody else. Ducks are beautiful birds, but most of them just sit on a mantle and there's no story, there's no narrative. And I really want to get more into saying things versus just doing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I switched to the birds and the hawks and the owls. And I've been very happy in that area ever since. And I haven't actually done a duck in years. Uh, and nothing against ducks. I love them. But I, I love telling the story more. Mm -hmm. uh, so the habitat's important. And it's important to even like sketch it out. Even if you can't draw, just kind of do a quick sketch. Get an idea of composition. Get an idea of shape. It also helps map it out in your own head about how big or how wide or how are you going to engineer it? Because, you know, typically we, uh, we start with all carvings with the classic bird on a stick on a base thing. And uh, some of us like to eliminate the base. So if you do that, you have to get to some kind of a tripod uh, structure for the thing to stand on its own. Uh, I've done that a few times and it's always satisfying to do that because the base can be sometimes, uh, it can interfere with the visuals. Um, mm -hmm. but, Typically, we paint them black to make them kind of invisible, uh, but they still, they're still there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I actually incorporate them into my piece just because they are still there. I might as well just include them somehow. So uh, I will do that from time to time. But, you know, 
quick drawing, a sketch, just, just real flippant, real easy, just basic shapes and basic concept helps put that in your mind what you're going to do. And it's very important to try and map that out first. And then you can kind of think about the engineering and then you can think about what materials I need and away we go. Then you know what kind of reference to dig up. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the process. It is for me anyway. Mm -hmm. That was uh, leads into another question. How do you research your habitats? Uh, well, like I mentioned earlier, take your phone, just take pictures of stuff. If you're right mm -hmm. near, you know, I go and walks in the woods and I see things like, oh, that looks fun. I just reach down there and grab my phone and take a picture of it. And I have a folder in my computer just called Habitat with all kinds of mini folders of different types of habitat. Uh, sometimes I just take pictures of things I think are interesting that I'm not even using right now, but I may go back to later and look at. Of course, you can get on the internet and then URL, just type in, you know, daylilies and mm -hmm. hit images and boom, you've got a million pictures and a million different colors. You can look at the different varieties of the plant and get an idea of what you want to do. Uh, certainly, and of course, books are a big help. I love the botanical uh, illustrations of plants. Well, these guys have taken the time to scientifically break it down from the roots right up to the top of the flower itself and break it down into the parts. Uh, the more you understand about what you're doing, the better you can uh, indicate or show that to others uh, in your work. Uh, so needless to say, there's no such thing as too much reference. That's almost like having too much fun. Uh, you're always going to look, look, look and dig and ask questions and get better acquainted with what you're trying to do. Uh, it's, it's, it's in the end, it's going to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, a quick question that, uh, that popped up in the chat, and I, I don't know if, um, what is the easiest method of soldering? Um, or what is the cheapest method? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I don't get into real fancy soldering. Uh, yeah. I buy the real thin solder like you use for electric circuit boards and stuff like that. Okay. And I learned from a jeweler a long time ago, you do not heat the solder, you heat the metal. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will heat the metal just a, you know, a little bit away from the spot where I want the solder to go. Uh, I've actually, and I've tried this and it works pretty well. They actually cut a small piece of the solder and lay it right there on the joint after they put the flux on because the flux is kind of sticky and just lay that solder and they heat the metal up and the solder just melts and joins it just like that. It's, it's really amazing. And I watched, I watched jewelers do that because I wasn't doing that at first. I was just like putting the flame right on the whole thing and burning it out and make, you know, because once you get a charcoal surface, your, your solder won't stick as well. So you got to take it all apart and clean it and sand it and, you know, put more flux on it and so forth. So I always found that, I've been doing that and it works out pretty well. It's, it's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Another question, what carver is your inspiration? Do you have a, 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 a particular mentor or uh, inspirer or more than one? Uh, I am fired up by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have, I have my favorites, of course, uh, Larry Barth and John Sharper at the top of the list have been for, since I got into this thing back in the eighties. I mean, these guys are just amazing. Uh, but you know, there are others just equally. So, you know, Keith Mueller and Gary Eigenberger and Tom Horn, uh, I, I'm probably leaving some great people out. Uh, but I'm also inspired. I love judging because I love to see what the novice and intermediate people bring to the table because they are so new at this. They don't really know about the rules, so mm -hmm. to speak. So creatively speaking, they break them all the time. And I always see such interesting things down there. And I'll say, well, that's a pretty cool idea. You know, I get a lot of ideas from them. So really, all the carvers inspire me in a way. My favorite part about the whole show business, if you will, is I want to see what everybody else brings. Mm -hmm. That's that's my favorite part. I just love mm -hmm. to just uh, look up everybody. So I'm inspired by all kinds of art, by all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, plus, plus, in general, I just enjoy the heck out of doing this so mm -hmm. i don't mm -hmm. need much inspiration to get fired up every day i, I have a ball you know it's, it's, <laughs> great, it's great fun and if the shows uh you know shows are great seeing the stuff live but there's always pictures um books yes. in the magazine we we always try to show as many uh finished carvings as we can because we uh we know they're inspiring um you want to see what other people are doing um oh sure mm-hmm 
Um, have you ever given any consideration to virtual classes? Do you do anything like that? Um, it's I thought about and talked about. Even mm -hmm. Tom Huntington and I talked about it at one point about three years ago. Um, what most people don't know, and for good reason, they don't know my dad. My dad was a movie maker, so I grew up with movie making since I was five years old. <laughs> and it's, an, it's a medium I understand quite well. Uh, the planning and uh, what needs to happen to do a virtual show, it's not like what people think, just, just turn a camera on and go. Um, live like that can have its problems. You want to be able to go back and like clean up a mistake or edit something that just doesn't come out quite right. And mm -hmm. if you did it in real time, it would take too long. Because uh, I teach a real time class here in Cuyahoga Falls. And if I tape just that class, you know, it's two and a half hours a session. Mm -hmm. You know, the class from start to finish is about 27 hours. So um, you don't want to do that either. Uh, so right now I'm teaching about four days a week. And I just don't have any additional time to consider a virtual mm -hmm. class at this time. It's not off the table. It's just not a priority at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, who knows what will happen? Uh, and, you know, I, I, I recognize that there's probably a very valuable uh, space in our in our art form for this kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, treatment. I, I have noticed that Josh Googie just released uh, four virtual programs. So uh, it, it doesn't get any better than Josh. So, uh, you know, if you're looking for virtual classes, get on his website. He just he just sent me an email just this last week about it. So uh, that would be something for for those of you looking for virtual uh, opportunities because you live far from where the classes are offered. I get that. Uh, that would be a great place to look. Uh, in Cuyahoga Falls, I, in the summer, I teach the, the uh, class not in a weekly format, but in a workshop format. So in July and August every year, I have one week where I teach the class as a workshop. And in the last five years, we've had at least anywhere from four to six people come to this thing from other states. Mm -hmm. As far as California, Arizona to Ohio, whatever, they just get a hotel in, in Cuyahoga Falls and stay for five days and come to class and do the workshop and go home. Uh, it's, it's not a terribly expensive workshop. I think it's only like $220 unless you're a member of this particular art school. Uh, and so actually the hotels probably cost more than the class, but it's designed for beginners. So we don't like them um, uh, spending too much money on that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the school provides the tools too. So you don't have to do anything. So we get in a plan and show up and everything's there waiting for you. Uh, so that's another consideration for Right now, you can uh, you can uh, get on the website for the Cuyahoga Valley Art Center. Uh, the summer classes for this year are already booked, but we do this every summer. And you can certainly contact the school and find out uh, more information if you want. Uh, it's a good way for beginners to get a little bit of guidance because uh, we take you from A to Z on a decorative songbird. And that's from carving it and texturing it and painting it. Uh, when you leave class, you have a, a footless bird, but you have a, a finished bird in your hands and you can go home and do the rest, the habitat and feed or whatever. But uh, that's another possibility. Yeah, that answers a question that came up in the chat. So it's the, uh, repeat the name again. And, and yeah, it's the Cuyahoga. Cuyahoga. Kaya, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll Ohio. spell it out for you guys. It's an <laughs> Indian muckety muck word. It means crooked river, I believe. It's C-U-Y-A-H-O-G-A. Valley Art Center, okay. and they have a website. Uh, they have a part where they, we offer classes on watercolor and, and pottery, all kinds of stuff, and bird carving. Uh, and you can certainly check into that. I teach a weekly class every fall, every spring, every winter. Uh, you know, one on Monday night, one on Tuesday afternoon. So if you live in the area, that's not a bad deal. But if you live in Arizona or Missouri, that could be a problem. So we changed it to the summer class. Instead of being weekly, we made that a workshop for a week. So this year is the week of, uh, well, actually, I'm starting my uh, class next Monday for five days, and then I'll do another one in August. Uh, but there won't be any more workshops till next summer. Uh, but if you uh, contact the school and get on the uh, list or get into the program early, you'll get notified when they release the class because they don't just release them right now. They release them mm -hmm. close to the time they're going to offer it. And you can get on the list and then and, and join the fun. Great, thank you. Um, we had a question about uh, painting with washes. Um, can you quickly kind of 
walk through how you use acrylic paint, the, the technique of using washes? Uh, if you're doing it right, you're using washes. Um, mm -hmm. Generally speaking, it's rare that I will apply the tube of paint on a bird where it's just pretty much straight out of the tube. It's always washed down. We paint in layers. And I try to teach my, my students the idea of when you look at a color, uh, you look at the bottom color and as you add colors, it'll change. Uh, and of course, even a color like, like uh, oh, just one of the siennas, if you put it as a wash, it's got a lighter tone, but if you keep applying that same wash on over and over as it dries, it gets darker and darker. Uh, so painting in washes is necessary because of the wonderful texturing we do, we spend all this time stoning and etching and burning and creating all this beautiful three-dimensional uh, surface to fill it up with paint seems kind of pointless mm -hmm. or why bother? Uh, so uh, I, will, I work with washes all the time. And of course, with acrylics, if you're trying to mix colors, water is your medium. That's, mm -hmm. your, that's your inner medium between mixing yellow with red or whatever. Uh, you know, you need that water. And I usually like damp the surface first and put the paint on. You can also use a two brush process where you take the brush that's clean and just grab the very edge of that paint you put on there and pull it into the water to help blend it through. Uh, it, it's a practice procedure, but you can do it. Uh, and lots, lots of top artists still paint with acrylics. They don't use airbrushes. They still get it all done with a hand brush and so forth. It's quite possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, so washes are, are necessary to protect your texture, but also it teaches a lot about color and how to mix color. And it makes blending a whole lot easier too. You're trying to blend thick paint you're not gonna get that smooth airbrush kind of blend from one color to the next. It's just gonna be really hard to do. Yeah, you go into a, a store and see all the different colors of paints that are available and you think, oh, well, I don't need to do any mixing at all. But really, oh. um, like you said, you, you're mixing all the time because none of those colors are, it'd be rare if it was perfect um, for what you need. Yeah, and with birds, there's so many feathers that have colors that blend into each other that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, you could have a, a raw sienna color and then a bird has it all over the place, but it also blends in with just some light tans or some, some ochres or some other kinds of colors or dark browns and different things like that. And you got to be able to uh, blend those in. Uh, so, yeah, you're always going to be blending something. If you want a soft looking bird, you're going to have to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and I'll, and I'll tell you, you can learn a lot just by painting on paper. Get some watercolor paper and just paint birds on paper and using washes with acrylics, not a watercolor paint, but acrylics. Mm -hmm. and you, can, you can learn how to, uh, to, to work with color better that way too. Don't worry about what it looks like so much as what kind of blend you're getting, what kind of, uh, you know, as you put the two colors together, are you getting that soft look that you want or is it still too blotchy? If it's too blotchy, why is that? Did you not use enough water? Wrong kind of brush, perhaps? Uh, you know, all these things can help you improve your painting uh, just by working on, a, like even on an index sheet, which is a very smooth paper, uh, very thick, so it won't, you know, crinkle up while you're trying to work with it. Uh, I use that a lot. Uh, sometimes when I'm trying to figure out uh, what kind of painting system I'm going to use on this bird, mm -hmm. go ahead and get some index and just kind of paint some different things and see what see what comes up. Mm -hmm. Do you use uh, do you use a variety of brands? Obviously, there are a, a, a wide variety of brands of acrylic paint out there, and these paints aren't specific to carving. Again, they are no. the, the typical acrylic paints. Um, do you have a brand or a number of brands you use? Yeah, yeah, and there are a few, but not too many. Uh, you can't get them at Hobby Lobby, forget it. You can't mm -hmm. get them at Michael's, forget it. Uh, well, wait a minute, I shouldn't say that. Liquid Tex has come out with a new new brand that dries matte. Because all the electric, uh, electric, all the Liquid Tex uh, paints out there typically dry glossy. Mm -hmm. And any of the other off-brand acrylics you buy dry glossy. You like mixing mediums to get dull that's fine i find a big, big pain and you know what uh so i like traditions i like joe sonia and i like chroma uh, and those three paints there are all acrylics and they all dry with a matte finish and uh i find uh, that those work uh, as well as we need them to we do, you don't want to use shiny acrylics because your bird starts to shine up and it just really kills 
that whole uh, uh it just doesn't look right <laughs> birds aren't shiny i mean they are iridescent sometimes but that's not the same thing interesting do you use a color wheel that's a question uh i don't but mm -hmm. it's kind of like right here <laughs> you know both color wheel in your head yeah both my parents were artists i've been painting and creating since four years old I actually started making a living as an artist when I was 13. Uh, so, you know, I didn't discover bird carving until I was almost 40 years old. Prior to that, I did uh, portraits, I did paintings. I, I, I was a sign maker, specializing specialized wooden signs for 35 years. Uh, I've muraled bands with airbrushes. I've done pin and all kinds of stuff. So the color wheel is kind of imprinted in my head. Uh, so if it's not imprinted in yours, which is probably a good thing, uh, get one because this gives you, uh, gives you an idea how color plays off each other. And uh, you know, you've heard about contrasting and complementary colors. Well, the wheel helps you understand that. And some of the times when you're planning your carbon, you want colors to be complementary. Other times you don't, like in a total presentation, you might want contrasting colors. So your bird pops out over your habitat. And it's nice to know what those contrasting colors or uh, you know, opposite colors are. Mm -hmm. And uh, that'll help you in your planning too, as far as what kind of habitat do I use an orange flower or do I use a red flower, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so if you don't have a color wheel, get one. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd let you borrow mine, but I know how to get it out. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a, a, another question from left field. Um, do you, what's the most realistic method to create snow in a winter <laughs> habitat. Um, snow is a devil. Yeah, snow is a uh, devil. We do not <laughs> cover snow in the book, no. I have to say. Um, um, it is a nasty thing. And when you look at snow, it's not smooth. It's kind of, it's, it's almost textured. Like when you do a decoy and you stipple it and you get that kind of, uh, so when I do snow on the ground, I would typically stipple it with a, with a sponge to get that mm -hmm. kind of feel. Uh, it's one of the few times where I almost always use an airbrush because you know, the thing about snow is uh, I, you, you can't hand paint any kind of uh, accent to it. So you have to use an airbrush to kind of create the shadows, the highlights, and, and so forth to kind of give it that, that sweeping motion that you have. I've seen it done many times where people try to put snow on branches. And maybe they use the acrylic to create the ice strips and stuff like that. I've not seen one that has convinced me particularly much that it really looks Mm -hmm. that it has the energy of snow. It looks like snow, but it just doesn't, it doesn't feel cold. <laughs> it doesn't mm -hmm. feel like what real snow is. I have stayed away from snow as much as possible. <laughs> A few times I've played with it. I have not been happy with it. It's like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Somebody asked whether you can use Christmas tree flocking. Um, sure. Um, I mean, I guess you could try anything. Oh, um, I've, I've used yeah. I've used sand and painted it white. Mm -hmm. uh, I've stippled. I've used flocking. There's a paint called snow paint, which was horrible. Um, you know, and I dabbled with snow on branches and stuff like that. And it just it always looks like paste. <laughs> so I don't know if one of you guys come up with it. Let this guy know he can do a chapter on it. Yeah, definitely. Variable. Definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, that that question has come up, and I know I you know you don't see a lot of carvings um, with snow, probably for that reason. It is tricky, although um, I have seen some. Um, oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah there have been. Uh, usually, it's it's uh, you know snow on the ground where you can like airbrush highlights and shadows and stuff, and give it the the idea of of chilly and cold snow, but. Uh, the stuff on branches and so forth has never really been a, a big uh, a big success, I should say. I've, I've seen lots of people do it, and rarely do I see one that I think looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just it, it looks like you know like the stuff you use for drywall stuck on a branch. It just has a pasty <laughs> look to it. It just doesn't doesn't appear soft and fluffy to me. But you know, and that's just me too. Don't don't base everything what I say. But uh, I've I found snow to be a really nasty little thing to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> a great challenge. Yes, very much. <laughs> um, we're coming uh, towards the end. I have a last question in, in case, unless a, a few more pop up. Um, 
Is there a, an aspect of your art form that you find particularly challenging? I mean, you mentioned, you know, you solder, you paint, you carve, uh, you research. Um, it really is a lot of things. Um, and um, maybe a lot come natural to you, but I imagine that no. there are things that don't come natural. There are things that don't come natural. Welding was something I had to learn. Uh, that was something I wanted to do because I, I, I saw what some of the other artists were doing with welding habitats. And I really liked the direction and energy it was approaching, but it, I didn't know doodah about it. So I had to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and I learned from other artists who took the time to show me. I called them up and they, they sat down and let me uh, work with them. They showed me how it worked. And I got the equipment from another artist who was not going to weld and so on and so forth. So that's been great. But, you know, I got into a, a little discussion with an artist who, who tried to infer that what I'm doing is a craft and, and then fighting words as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, I've been an artist all my life and I use everything I've ever learned to do this art form and others that I've learned along the way. Uh, there are a lot of disciplines. And so some of it comes naturally. I mean, to each his own gifts. I mean, we all have our own certain amount of what we're born with. I was fortunate to have uh, two parents as artists and I have a pretty good uh, pretty good feel for art in a natural way, but I teach this to people who don't have that situation and they learn. It can be learned. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, so you'll find, and probably everybody will agree that painting is the most challenging part. Um, I am never happy with my painting. I'm always thinking the bird I did before I'm competing with the one I'm doing now. Uh -huh. I want to make it better than the last one I made. So if you're competing against other carvers, you're wasting your time because you can't really see their work all the time to compare. But if you're competing with yourself, that's the best way to go because I'm always trying to improve the bird I'm on uh, to make it better than the one I just did. Mm -hmm. And painting has always been that, that careful little edge of, uh, gee, what, what do I do and how do I do it? Uh, and I don't really have a 100% painting program. Some guys do, I don't. I'm always kind of, tweaking it a little bit each time, adding something to it, taking something away. Uh, I'm never totally happy. Uh, so um, painting will be your biggest challenge. And of course, like I say, practicing on index sheet would be a good thing to do. Uh, the more painting practice you have, the better. I had one student who really was very rough on the painting part and didn't just take bird carving at the, class, at the school. They took watercolor classes and learned how to paint just pictures and sceneries and so forth. And that helped her immensely mm -hmm. uh, as far as blending and understanding uh, how colors work together and, and control the brush and so on and so forth. And her, her bird painting really improved a great deal after doing that. So I certainly encourage flat painting anytime you can do it. A, a quick question. You mentioned welding. Uh, do you mean welding yeah. or soldering or both? Um, I do both. I mean, you you know, okay. uh, on the, uh, on the uh, hummingbird piece, for instance, there was no need for welding. Uh, soldering mm -hmm. could handle everything that was there. Uh, uh, piece I did for the last world when we had one, <laughs> uh, I did a branch that was all welded, every bit mm -hmm. of it. Uh, and it was necessary because I wanted all these kind of like, almost like Disney-esque kind of bends in the branches and stuff. And you can't do that with solder, but you can sure do that with, with the uh, brass rod. You can crank it up and make it all kind of creepy and crinkly and, uh, you know, like like old fingers or something but uh, mm -hmm. uh so again i just i just size up what it is i'm trying to do in the uh in the planning process I think is this going to be a you know a welded thing or soldered sometimes both mm -hmm. sometimes i'll do a little of both uh but i don't have a fixed uh process just whatever i think will work the best and um this was touched on in the chat, something about mistakes. Um, so I'll ask you, do you make mistakes? Oh, yeah, a whole box of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, everything you sit in your studio, you don't just, I mean, maybe you do turn out uh, masterpiece after no, masterpiece. No, I mean, it just no. is not realistic. Um, I have a box of real disasters. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's just because I'm such a, a, a nut about not throwing things away that I don't, but I should, probably should just burn them. They're just terrible. Uh, you know, I, I get so far and look at it, it's like, ah, you know, I cut off the whole side of this bird. I don't have enough to make scapulars. And, you know, this is, this is wrong or the head's in the wrong spot or, you know, I get the same thing. Uh, but I don't dismay about it because I really enjoy this art form. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but all kinds of artists I mentioned, but I like I like this one a lot, and I have a good time. So if I have to do it over. That's just twice the fun. Mm -hmm. so, 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 <laughs> someone new, to, someone <laughs> new to this um, has to realize that you know mistakes yeah, are really I mean, part of the process. I mean, if you're an artist and you draw or you paint, you're going to sketch out some painting. You're going to do of a barn and this little river running through it and trees, and you might lay it out and and, and get part way through it, and you say, ugh. You crinkle up, pitch it off, and you draw it again. You keep doing it. If you really talk to artists who work a lot, they'll tell you that you know it's rare that just sit down and the, and the original piece becomes the final piece. Mm -hmm. uh, as as they get thirty or forty years experience into it, they're more inclined to be able to pull that off. But newer artists are going to make mistakes. You newer carvers, you're going to make mistakes. Don't get so connected with it. Uh, remember, it is woodworking, so wood can be you know glued and screwed and put back together again if you have to. But you know, if you're carving something and the head is obviously wrong and you know it, even if you're uh, a new carver and you still know it, you should probably just cut out a new blank and start over. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to push a mistake through just, just makes it all the worse. And, mm -hmm. you know, even when it's painted and done, it just doesn't have that, that look that you want. Yeah, don't, don't be married to them. If they're not working out, they're not working out. I have a box in my shop and it's full of them. And mm -hmm. you probably have one too. <laughs> well, with that, um, you know, I'd like to thank you uh, again for joining us. And, and, and I know people um, um, really value um, your insight and your, uh, your uh, instruction. Um, so uh, thank you for joining, um, joining us, Tom. Um, oh, you're very welcome. Yep. And again, I'll remind everyone Tom's work um, uh is featured in the book Bird Habitat. He's a regular contributor to the magazine. Um, so um, if you participated in this um, live stream, I, I thank you for, for participating. And uh, because you participated, um, you're get a first crack at these special offers. So go to wildfowlcarving.com new book um, for a special book club offer. Um, thanks again, we appreciate it. Um, oh, another thing too. Here's a um, offer we'll um, present on some of our, our um, uh, past books. Um, a big sale, save 75%. And again, that's wildfowlcarving.com store. And there's the promo code you can uh, jot down. So um, want to make it worth your while to both join the book club and subscribe to the magazine um, and check out the website. And thanks again. If I, if I could, uh, before you mm -hmm. sign off, I uh, want to remind everybody, if you've really been having a lot of struggles with Habitat, this latest book is a must-have. It covers just about everything you might want to ever do for your bird carving. And it's by artists who really have a good control of their medium and really uh, share some good ideas. Uh, so don't, don't hesitate to get it if you're having trouble with, with Habitat. And along with that, I'd like to say thanks for having me. And by all means, guys and gals, keep it fun. Have a good time. <laughs> Thank you. Great words. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome.